everyone. So this is the lecture for chapter one uh, for Business Accounting 186. So we're going to introduce the financial statements. If you watched my introductory video, I explained to you how this looks in the real world. Um, so this is the first part of how we actually get to these financial statements. And the way this book uh, goes, it kind of shows you the big picture first. And then we start diving into the nitty gritty details of um, how we put together these financial statements, really starting in chapter two. So chapter one is more of a big picture overview. So let's take a look. So here's an example of an income statement for the Walt Disney Company. You can see this compares um, two time periods, 2015 and 2016. And these are one year periods, 12 months ended on these dates. Uh, so again, an income statement is a period of time, okay, uh, versus a balance sheet, which we'll look at, which is a specific point in time. So uh, just a few terminology things just to start introducing to you. You'll want to learn things like revenue, um, cost of products and services, um, all of these different depreciation and amortization. Uh, you'll see there's a lot of vocabulary that you have to get comfortable with as you learn, as you enter the world of finance and accounting. So here are the learning objectives for this chapter and this part. Uh, we want to explain why accounting is critical to business, um, explain and apply the underlying accounting concepts, assumptions, and principles, apply the accounting equation, so learn what that is and apply it, actually construct financial statements and analyze the relationships among them. You will see that they are closely tied together. And we'll uh, talk and briefly touch on evaluating business decisions ethically. So why is accounting critical to business? Essentially, accounting measures business activities. Um, it takes a bunch of data, a bunch of things that happen, and organizes them into financial statements and reports that then can be used by decision makers. So um, think of a decision maker can be one of many people. It could be uh, someone who's going to take a job at the company, maybe a banker who is looking to lend money to the company, or maybe an individual who is looking to invest in the company. So this is the way you can evaluate a company and decide if that's a good approach. Um, so the flow of information when it comes to accounting is decisions are made. Um, based on those decisions, some business transactions occur. And then based on those transactions, um, results are put together or compiled and put together. Uh, and based on those results, we make some business decisions. So you can see it becomes a cycle. Uh, so who uses this information? Uh, generally, it's individuals. So again, like I said earlier, employees can be an example of that or somebody who wants to um, invest in a company that would probably fall under, more under investors. Creditors, so individuals or banks that want to lend to the company. Uh, government regulatory bodies that have uh, regulation and laws um, that need to be, where companies need to be evaluated as to whether or not they are complying with them. Um, even nonprofit organizations. So if you want to go work for a nonprofit, um, in fact, there is a special system of accounting for nonprofits. There's two types of accounting, um, largely speaking. There's financial accounting. This is basically for outsiders. That's who it's tied for. Uh, there's also something called managerial accounting. Um, this doesn't follow the same. So this is a bunch of rules that we'll introduce in a second. They're called generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. Managerial accounting, uh, largely some of it uses GAAP, but it also can be um, go against the rules because you're looking for information for inside people. So sometimes you, your manager wants to make a decision how much to charge for a product, whether to produce more of a product, product whatever the case may be, um, but you're not sending it to the outside world, you're keeping it within the organization. So those are the differences. So for DVC, this is going to be covered in Business Accounting 187, and this is what we're going to focus on in uh, this class. Uh, it's important to understand first the different types of business organization. If you have taken Business 109, you probably already covered this, but um, just some quick notes here. A proprietorship is just, there's no real legal um, setup for a proprietorship. So if you're somebody who goes, and when you were 15 years old, if you went and babysat your neighbor's kids um, and they paid you money, whether you 
thought you did or you didn't, you actually had a proprietorship. So um, it's just one owner, also called the proprietor, and the important part here is personal liability. In other words, if something happens and your company gets sued, can you as the owner of the company lose your personal stuff, your house, your car, whatever the case may be? If you're in a proprietorship, yes, you can. A partnership is basically like a proprietorship, but with more people. So it's generally two or more owners. Uh, the general partners um, are the partners who actually work in the business will be personally liable, meaning uh, bankers and other people can go after their personal assets. Again, think of your car, your house, things like that. Um, there are special types of partners called limited partners, usually somebody who simply invests money in the partnership but doesn't actually work in it. Um, those people generally are not, hence the word limited. Their liability is limited. You can see the problem with both a standard um, proprietorship and if you're just a general partner in a partnership. So um, one of the things that has been created within the United States legal system is what's called an LLC or limited liability company. And this very much looks like a part uh, like a proprietorship, but the members, so the, the owners are called members, and the members are not personally liable for uh, things that the LLC or limited li liability company does, hence the name, limited liability company. And the most common, which we will focus on in this class, uh, is the corporation. Um, you should know that there's two types of a corporation called an S corp and an C corp. Um, you don't really need to know this for the purposes of this class, but I think, you know, as you take further classes in finance and accounting, it's important that you realize that there's two different types. Um, we call owners of a corporation stockholders. There can be many of them. If you think about a company like Apple, there's probably tens of thousands of owners of Apple because anybody who owns a share of Apple is an owner. And obviously stockholders are not personally liable. And you can see why big companies really have to be corporations. If you own a share of Apple and you are personally liable, um, you probably don't even have access to get onto Apple's campus. So you have almost no control over what Apple does. Certainly you wouldn't want to be sued for bad things that Apple does. So let's quickly talk a little bit more in depth about each one of these. So again, proprietorship, single owner, think of it like small retail stores, solo providers of professional services, maybe a hair salon. Um, you are personally liable for all business debts. So if you go and take out a loan and you can't pay back that loan, then you as the owner have to dig into your pocket to pay it. For accounting purposes though, this is still what's called a distinct entity, meaning it is separate than the owner. In other words, if the owner goes out and buys a car personally, we're not gonna account for that in the business, um, even though it's a sole proprietorship, right? We're gonna have a separate set of books for the business than the owner might have. Partnership, again, is very similar. It's just two or more parties. Um, incomes and losses flow through to partners. And again, there's something called limited liability partnerships uh, where the partners are only liable up to whatever money they put into it. They, you can't go after their cars and houses and personal stuff. Limited liability company, like I mentioned, is where um, it's, it's a very easy setup. It is a legal entity, so you will file paperwork uh, with the state. Um, and the owners, which there may be one or many, are called members and the income is gonna flow through to the members. So you'll see in a corporation here, um, it's owned by stockholders. Uh, it can do things like issue stock. So it helps when it's a big company because you can raise lots of capital or lots of money to expand your company. Uh, it gets formed under state law, the most popular being Delaware. It's the most popular mainly because uh, it has a long history of um, corporate law, and so the court system is very well developed for corporate law. It's legally distinct from its owners, so, meaning um, if you own shares of Apple, when you die, Apple doesn't die. Apple keeps going, right? Your shares maybe go on to your kids or whatever the case may be, but it's a separate kind of, think of it like a paper human, a separate paper human. 
And obviously, stockholders have no personal obligation for debts. There's limited liability. So if it turns out that Apple's products cause cancer and Apple gets sued for, you know, a gazillion dollars, you as an owner of a share of Apple, the most you can lose is what you invested in your share of Apple, that it goes to zero. But no one can come after your house or car. One of some of the negatives of a corporation is there's double taxation. The corporation has to pay tax, and then when the corporation pays out money to the owners called dividends, the owners or shareholders are also taxed. Um, the way the process works is that stockholders elect what's called a board of directors. They're the ones who pick the CEO, CFO, and they're the ones who set policy uh, for the company. So let's look at some underlying uh, accounting concepts, assumptions, and principles. So again, the framework is, uh, and the rules are called, for this class, are called generally accepted accounting principles, or GAAP. You will hear this term over and over again in your professional career, so always remember GAAP. Uh, it's formulated by the Financial Accounting Standards Board. Um, when you read through this chapter, you'll learn a little bit more about them. Uh, there's also an international version of these rules called International Financial Reporting Standards, or IFRS. There is a big move right now to make IFRS and GAAP basically look like one and the same because companies are struggling um, with having to uh, follow two sets of rules, right? It becomes very onerous. Accountants and finance people are very expensive, so big companies like Apple would like to have one set of rules. Um, the IFRS is designed by International Accounting Standards Board. It's also known as the IS, IASB. So FASB, you'll hear a lot for um, the U.S. version of the board. And IASB um, is for the international board. So what is the foundation of accounting? So if you think of the big picture objective, you're really trying to provide financial information about a reporting entity um, to investors, lenders, other creditors, so that they can make decisions, right? The key thing is they want to make decisions. So there's some qualitative um, characteristics that we want to look at, which is, is it relevant and are you faithfully representing what it is that the company does, right? What's going on? Uh, there's some other what's called enhancing qualitative characteristics. Um, I want to be able to compare. So not only from period to period, from one year to the next, I should be able to compare your company and it should make sense, but also be able to compare similar companies. So I should be able to look at Apple's results and Google's results and be able to kind of have them side by side and make some um, quick decisions uh, based on that comparison, right? So there has to be some consistency in how things are done. Um, I should be able to verify the data that you provide. So um, there should be something to back up what you're telling me and what you're showing. It should be timely. Uh, I don't really care about something if it's five years from now. I really want to know as soon as possible. So as soon as it's feasibly possible to provide me with information, especially in today's information age, um, it needs to be made available. And I should be able to understand it. So even if I don't know the ins and outs of your business, if I look through your financial statements, there are some conclusions I should be able to draw simply because I understand finance and accounting. Obviously, the big constraint is cost. Uh, finance professionals are very expensive. Um, collecting this data is an expensive and time-consuming process. So we have to do this cost-benefit analysis. So let's talk about some big picture assumptions and principles. So one is the entity assumption. This means that an organization stands apart from other organizations and individuals as a separate economic unit. So long story short, think of Tesla. Elon Musk owns a bunch of Tesla. He's a major owner of the company Tesla. But Elon Musk, if he has a mortgage on a house in Beverly Hills, that mortgage does not show up anywhere on Tesla's financials, right? It is completely separate from the business. We make an assumption that the company is a, con a continuity or going concern assumption, meaning um, the entity is going to continue to operate for the foreseeable future. Our rules that we discuss here fall apart if I assume that your company may stop operating soon, right? So that's very important. Another big picture assumption is historical cost. This means that assets need to be recorded at their actual cost on the date of purchase. So as an example there, 
think of Disneyland, right? So Disneyland bought the land in Anaheim that Disneyland sits on many, many years ago for probably a low cost because it was farmland at the time. Now that land is worth way more money. But if I look at the financial statements of Disney, I'm gonna see that land at that old purchase price. Finally, we also make the assumption that stable monetary unit assumption. This just, all this means is that inflation is stable. That's it. So these rules will not make any sense in a place like Venezuela or Zimbabwe or places where inflation is out of control, right? Because the financials are basically useless as soon as they're printed. So we make the assumption that when you're following these rules and preparing the financials, that inflation is stable. It's not that inflation is zero, but it's maybe 2% or 3% long-term stable inflation. So let's talk about the accounting equation. This is basically the balance sheet and it is the key to accounting. That is, and we'll talk about the double entry system here in the next chapter, but the idea is that your assets must equal your liabilities plus your equity. So if your assets are 20 and your liabilities are seven, your equity must be 13. If this equation ever breaks down, you have a mistake. So here's a visual of that same concept. So let's define these three things a little bit better. So what are assets? So think of assets as a resource where that, that will produce future benefit. So some future benefit. Most people think of assets as things like a computer or a car, but assets uh, for most companies actually tend not to be what are called tangible assets, but rather intangible assets. Especially in the San Francisco Bay Area, the biggest value for most companies is in their brand name or in their intellectual property, like their patents. That's where most of the value is. If you think about a company like Uber, it's worth around $50 billion. Well, really, Uber is a bunch of guys and girls in some um, in some office in San Francisco with a bunch of computers. It's not a lot of value from that perspective. What makes Uber so valuable is really its technology and its network. Liabilities are outsider claims. So people that are outsiders, stuff that is owed to outsiders, like debts that are payable to outsiders. And that's a key word. When you see the word payable, it's generally talking about the liabilities section. Finally, you have stockholders' equity. These are the insider's claims, right? So the best example I can give you here and going into the accounting equation, well, here are some examples, but let me, before I go there, let me do the, say this. If you um, own a, so assets equals liabilities plus equity. We can call it stockholders' equity. I'll use shorthand here. So if you own a car that's worth $10,000, that's your car, the value is $10,000, right? Um, of that $10,000, let's say you have a loan to a bank for $4,000. So an outsider, a bank, is owed owns $4,000 of that car. That means you, the insider, own the other $6,000 of that, the value of that car. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. So here's some examples of assets that you'll see. Cash and cash equivalents, inventories, property planning equipment. Again, these are very tangible assets, things you can touch, but there are other things like patents right, that are intangible but very, very valuable. Liabilities, again, anytime you see the word payable, accounts payable, so I owe some, um, somebody, I bought something on credit from another company, so I still have to pay for it. Income taxes payable, I own income taxes to the government. Long-term debt, I take out long-term debt. Long-term debt is defined as um, greater than one year before I pay it back. And stockholders' equity is basically just your assets minus your liabilities. This is just rewriting the equation, assets equals liabilities plus stockholders' equity. If I rewrite that, I can get assets minus liabilities equals stockholders' equity, right? Just simple algebra. A corporation has two parts that for stockholders' equity. There's paid-in capital and there's retained earnings, that should really say. So retained earnings is income that my company makes that I keep within the company. I don't pay it out as a dividend. Paid in capital 
are any invest, initial investments or money that is put in by insiders into the company. So when I first set up a company, and let's say I put in $10,000 so that the company can start buying some equipment, that $10,000 is part of paid in capital, right? Once my company starts operating and it holds and it starts making money, so maybe I provide a service to somebody and they pay me $100 and providing that service cost me $20, so I made $80, that $80 of income will end up in retained earnings. So here's another way of looking at it. Paid in capital, the amount stockholders have invested in the business. Retained earnings, the amount of earned income that is kept for use in the business. And again, this is mostly vocabulary in this chapter. As you start working with actual numbers and you start working with problems in class uh, and for homework, you'll see how this applies um, with actual numbers and in the real world. Right now, it's a lot of vocabulary. So here's just a visual of how retained earnings um, is calculated, okay? So you're gonna start with the beginning balance of retained earnings, the beginning balance of retained earnings is simply the ending balance from the previous period, right? If your company just got started, then your beginning balance is going to be zero, right? Then you'll look for a specific period. You'll look at your revenues. You'll subtract expenses, and that gives you your net income. So you'll take your beginning balance of retained earnings, add net income, or subtract it if it's a net loss. So it would be a net loss if your expenses exceed your revenues, then um, you would subtract any dividends that were paid, and whatever's left, that's going to be your retained earnings at the end of the period, right? Which becomes your, retain, your next period's beginning retained earnings. So here's some additional um, definitions. Revenues are inflows of resources from delivering goods and services. Most of the time this is money, but it doesn't have to be. Somebody can pay you by giving you a car or something else. It doesn't have to be dollars, but it, it most often is dollars. Revenues increase retained earnings. Expenses are outflows of resources because you have some costs of operations. If you're running a hair salon, you probably have to pay electricity, you have to pay rent, things like that. Um, expenses will decrease retained earnings. Dividends are just distributing assets. Again, most of the time this is money to stockholders, but it doesn't have to be. A company, a corporation can distribute a machine or a car or whatever the case may be, but most of the, the time this is dollars that gets uh, distributed to stockholders, and that's called a dividend when, you, when a company gives assets to its owners. And when you pay out dividends, you are decreasing retained earnings because you're not retaining them in the company, you are giving them over to the owners. So let's construct the financial statements and analyze the relationship um, between them. So here you can kind of read through this. I'm not gonna repeat it for you. Um, some of the questions that somebody might ask of a company, what financial statement you would look at and how you would figure out the answer. So, you know, how to think about this. How well did the company perform during the year? Where would I find that? On the income statement, right? Sometimes, as I showed you in the intro video, it can be called also the statement of operations. And what is the math there? It's revenues minus expenses gives us our net income, right? And that shows up on the income statement. So you can read through these questions and um, we can discuss it more in class as we do problems. So the way that the financial statements are prepared is you have a bunch of activity in a given period. You're going to track that activity on the income statement. Once that period ends, you're going to be able to figure out your statement of retained earnings. You're going to be able to calculate it. Again, that's your beginning retained earnings plus or minus any net income, which is coming from your income statement, minus any dividends. And that's going to equal your ending retained earnings. That ending retained earnings is going to go on your balance sheet. And then once you have your balance sheet completed, um, and we won't talk about this till towards the end of the course, but then you can create your statement of cash flows. So this is just a definition for income statement. So this reports revenues and expenses for a period of time, right? So it's over a period of time. So here's an equation that you can learn. Um, and again, we're gonna practice lots of this. This is just definitions. You really need to practice this 
um, for it to start making sense. So here's an example of the Walt Disney Company, a consolidated statement of income. We'll talk later in the class about what it, what it means when it says consolidated, but this gives you an example. You can see revenues, and they just break it out here. Um, you can see various expenses, and we'll talk about these more in detail. And then the bottom line, after you've paid taxes and everything, is net income. One of the things I want to point out here, too, sometimes people get confused on this. So companies will tend not to show you down to the exact penny. It's not that um, Disney made $9,391. You have to look up in the top of the form, and you can say this is in millions of dollars meaning that Disney's net income was actually, you have to add in six zeros, so nine point, almost $9.4 billion for this period, right, for this 12-month period. So it's important that you look up here and figure out what form this is written in. So the statement of retained earnings, this is, again, the portion of net income that gets reinvested in the business that's not paid out as dividends, um, net income is going to increase retained earnings. Any losses and dividends will decrease retained earnings. Okay, um, Net income or net loss flows from the income statement and into the statement of retained earnings. So here's the math behind retained earnings. You have beginning retained earnings, which again, if you just started your company, it's going to be zero. If your company has been going on, then this was whatever the ending from previous period was. Then we're going to add net income or subtract, if it's a loss, subtract any dividends that are declared, and then we get our ending retained earnings. This is going to go on to the balance sheet. So here you can look at a real-world example of Disney's retained earnings. Here they actually bunch two years worth, so don't get too confused, but you can see you have... Um, basically beginning retained earnings plus net income minus dividends minus this other reductions don't worry about it right now that gives you your ending retained earnings that's going to go on the balance sheet and then it does one more year's worth so again for the next period you have another period of net income subtract dividends for that period again you have this other don't worry about it and then you have ending for the following period all of this leads us to this um, balance sheet, which sometimes is also called statement of financial position. The key thing is, unlike an income statement that could be a, a period in time, a balance sheet is a specific point in time. Okay? It reports assets, liabilities, and stockholders' equity. It is your accounting equation. Assets equals liabilities plus stockholders' equity. That's why we call it a balance sheet. We're going to dive into all the pieces of a balance sheet. In fact, most of this course focuses on the line items in the balance sheet. So we'll just do some quick examples. Um, we'll talk about assets, and we'll break those down into current assets and long-term assets. So current assets are things that will be used within one business cycle or one year is um, pretty often the, the case. Long-term assets are things that are greater than one fiscal year. By the way, people get confused. A calendar year would be something like January 1st to December 31st. A fiscal year is any 12-month period. So it might go from June 15th until June 14th of the next year or whatever the case may be. But it just means what is your financial year? It does not have to be the calendar year. So as you can see, Disney, in fact, has fiscal years that end in October. Right, you can see so they're 12 month periods, it's just not January 1st till uh, December 31st. And so, right now, we're just looking at the top portion of the balance sheet, the assets. So, you can see the listing out of the current assets, the listing out of long term assets. Right, and what I want to point out to you is intangible assets. So, this is like the Disney um, patents that they have. Look how much, how much value there is in those. In fact, Intangible assets are bigger than um, all of the total current assets at Disney, right? If you, in fact, if you look at the total overall assets, it's about one third of it is stuff you can't really touch, like patents.
looking at the bottom section of the balance sheet, you have current liabilities and long-term liabilities. So same concept, current liabilities are debts that you have to pay within a year. Here are some examples. Long-term liabilities are debts that are payable after one year. So things like long-term notes payable, long-term bonds payable. So here is looking at the liabilities section of um, Disney's balance sheet. So you'll see a couple line items here, long-term due in longer than one year, long-term borrowings, other, um, some of these we'll talk about, but most of this actually comes in more high level uh, intermediate and advanced accounting classes. Finally, we talk about the stockholder's equity or stockholder's ownership of the business assets. So terms you're gonna see in this section, common stock, additional paid in capital, retained earnings, treasury stock, accumulated other comprehensive income. We're gonna talk about all of these different line items throughout this course, um, not necessarily in this chapter, but you'll, this is your first introduction into this and it goes a little bit more into depth when you read the chapter. So again, for Disney, here are some things, common stock, retained earnings, treasury stock, other equity. And the key part here is if we look, the total assets equals the total liabilities plus stockholders equity, right? And this is assets. So this is the accounting equation. If this does not hold true, you have a mistake somewhere. Finally, we have the statement of cash flows. Um, we need to understand the income statement and the balance sheet before we can create the statement of cash flows. So the way this book and this class works is we'll talk about the statement of cash flows almost in every chapter, but we actually won't prepare one until we get to the very end of the course. So um, there's a couple different ways you can prepare a statement of cash flows and it'll make more sense once we're there. For now, let's just learn some basic um, terminology of things that show up on a statement of cash flows. So a statement of cash flow basically shows cash receipts and cash payments, cash going in and cash coming, um, uh, going out of a company. And, and it's broken out into three different types of activities. Operating activities, so cash that comes in from like selling goods and services to customers. Investing activities, now cash that comes in from buying and selling long-term assets, and then financing activities, cash that comes in from borrowing or repaying funds or equity transactions. So here's just a visual of a real-world statement of cash flows um, for the Disney company. So you can see operating activities, um, they use what's called the indirect method. Again, this will make more sense later but this is what you're looking up here is the indirect method. And then you can see investing activities and you can see the different things that fall under here and then financing activities and you can see the different things that fall under here. So here is the key, key takeaway from this chapter and we're gonna work on some problems in class and you're gonna have homework problems and quiz problems. This is really important and this is kind of your first aha moment in this class will be how all of this ties together. So you'll see that if I have my income statement here, I have my total revenues, my total expenses, I get my net income. My net income goes into calculating my ending retained earnings. I have my starting retained earnings, plus that net income, minus the dividends, minus this other, that gives me my ending retained earnings. I need this ending retained earnings to plug into my balance sheet down here. That's my retained earnings line item and that should make everything balance. So all of these financial statements are related. And so you're gonna work on a problem and we're gonna work in class on problems that show and help you understand how this, these relationships work. And when you look at cash and cash equivalents, this amount up here on the balance sheet also comes from this consolidated statement of cash flows. So the bottom line of the statement of cash flows is gonna show how much cash do I have at the end of the year? It's gonna show that number and that number is gonna go on the balance sheet. So finally, ethics and business. This is a really, really important concept in business. Thanks to social media, um, it's one, once you're found to be unethical, uh, you kind of get blacklisted in business. So this is very, very important to understand because a lot of times 
yes, ethical could is definitely something that's illegal is definitely unethical. But for most people, um, the problem is more of the gray area situations. And so those are the ones that are really key. Um, there's really three factors. So let's look at this in detail. There's three factors that influence business and accounting decisions. So there's an economic factor, right? I want to maximize my economic benefits. I want to make as much money as possible. There's the legal factor, right? Um, we've created a set of laws, right? They're written and to provide clarity and to provide and to prevent abuse of others' rights. So there's a legal framework and there's also an ethical framework. So even when something is profitable and legal, are the actions still right? That is really where ethics goes. So it goes one step deeper than economic or legal. And it's becoming more and more important in today's social media world. So within accounting, there's an organization called the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Um, I'm actually a member of this group. So they provide a lot of great information. And one of the things they've set out is put on a, uh, set out as a code of professional conduct. And they have these principles that they discuss, what the responsibilities are, that you act in the best interest of the public, that you act with integrity, that you are objective and independent, that do, you, have, do, you exercise due care, and the scope and nature of the services you provide is clearly spelled out. So that is all for this chapter. Um, I hope that this lecture uh, provided some additional deeper information than what you just read in the chapter. Again, this is not meant to cover everything. So please go in and read the chapter in the textbook. Um, there's a lot of nuances and um, oftentimes this takes uh, you know, multiple reads and multiple listens for it to click. But hopefully...